For your brain to do anything, chemical movements have to occur. You move your pinky, chemical movements have to occur. You have a thought, chemical movements have to occur. You are your chemical disposition. So the definition of health is the ability to manage all the different chemicals the brain produces within a normative range at all times. That's your health peak. Then what's the definition of pathology? The inability to manage certain chemicals in certain regions at certain periods of time. Definition of health really is homostasis, chemical balance. When you have chemical balance, you perform optimally. Your body, your mind, and your emotion. You can damage transmitters or receptors by heredity. You can be born with them. Um, you guys are educators. You know you can be born with this kind of stuff. 60 to 80% of emotional disorders have hereditary features, which also means you need to kill one of your favorite refrains, which is, I wish the parents of these kids would just do a better job. Oftentimes, the parents of the most pathological kids cannot do a better job because they bring to the table what? Similar psychiatric features. You can damage transmitters or receptors by trauma. A single act of trauma can restructure the human brain. Repetitive, persistent trauma, guaranteed restructured. You can damage transmitters or receptors by a thing called depravity. The lack of exposure to stimuli required to stimulate brain growth in certain regions in crucial periods. Puberty causes the restructuring of the human brain. During that restructuring period, you have a massive new growth of gray matter in the frontal lobe, which actually now we know exceeds zero to two. Exceeds zero to two. So there is another period of time that is crucial for stimuli. Let me put it a different way. Oftentimes, what kids are doing during that period of time is more predictive than lots of other things because it starts to talk about template of future capacity. And why is school climate so important? Your climate needs to be able to promote homostasis so people perform optimally. When you don't, everyone will suffer. And when I say everyone, I'm not talking about students only. I'm talking about your staff. I'm talking about every person involved will suffer. We're going to start today with a pyramid of human behavior. And um, a pyramid of human behavior or a way of understanding humans is based on saying this. If you understand these factors, you can explain anyone's behaviors. Heredity, where you start. Temperament, how you react. Exposure, what you adjust to. And high emotional experiences, what you will do when you are stressed. So everybody starts at a certain place in life just the way it is, and it is predictive, but not a predeterminate. Now we now know that your chemical disposition is predictive of your emotional well-being, it is a predictive of your physical capacity, it is predictive of your cognitive capacity, but the thing that wasn't known was it is predictive of your language capacity. Your brain is really doing some really cool things to help any deficit area. It's called compensation, which is a very old theory, but still holds true. Compensation basically says your brain will compensate for deficit areas. This is the entire premise of brain-based instruction in a nutshell. Overly simplified, but true. How do I take weaker regions and help them compensate for language or comprehension deficit? We're not gonna to touch on brain-based instruction today and it always, always saddens me when we don't because I think administrators should know more about brain-based instruction as they do about all the other management of schools. I wanna bring up a word today called neurogenesis. Now, in the field of neuroscience up to not that long ago, neurogenesis was perceived as something that did not happen. Neurogenesis is a fancy way of saying that your brain is regenerating. The theory that existed for a long, 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 long time was you got what you got when you got it. And all you can do is lose it, but you got so much of it, we hardly know about you losing it. If you undergo stress, 
the human brain will hunker down, stop regeneration until you get over the stress. Then it'll take you a period of time to regain your homostasis. So let's say you've been under stress for two weeks. You're in balance, a little. Your road back, not that bad. Let's say you've been under stress for two months. Your imbalance, more severe. Your road back, a little bit more complicated. Let's say you've been under stress for two years. Your imbalance, severe. Your road back, extremely complicated because oftentimes on your way back, what happens? Other stuff. Huh. So you're telling me kids who have persistent exposure to stress without really having cognitive deficits could show such severe imbalance that they will struggle with behavior and learning. Education is famous for rejecting things that are new because it surges your amygdala and rejecting and, and accepting things that have failed that are familiar. To the point where there was research done on educational programs. You are more apt to buy a program that resembles a program that failed than you are a program that may, may have more validity now, but is completely new to you. But there's another beautiful thing about the brain. If you are aware of something is happening and can predict it occurring, you can control the emergent emotional surge and actually have more thoughtful analysis. So step one for helping students who struggle is ritualizing your at least major transitions. Two most impulsive periods of human development. That early childhood and the few years surrounding puberty, which ranges. A ritual to human brain is something that is taught, practiced, and reinforced. I will teach you what I mean by reinforcement later. Taught, practiced, reinforced. If those elements aren't there, you do not have a ritual. Is a schedule a ritual? No, a schedule is a schedule. You don't, a schedule is a schedule. Lots of people think I have a ritual, I have a schedule. A schedule is not a ritual. A schedule, a ritual tells me what I'm supposed to do in a sequential order of how I'm supposed to do it. That's a ritual. Temperament is your natural response to stimuli. You are born with your temperament. Some people have a higher response to stimuli. Some people have a lower response to stimuli. There are three rules to stimuli that you need to know. One. A lot of stimuli is worse than a little. Second rule of stimuli. Anything that is new is more chemically charged than things that are familiar. And the last rule of stimuli. Anything you perceive to be threatening is worst of all. What is the key word in that phrase? Perceived. Perceived. What can we do? Teach based on what you know. Ritualize the environments. How do we know that will work? First, we looked at infants who had this chemical disposition of overreaction to stimuli. And we saw if they were put in a structured, ritualized environment, the DRD2 receptors started healing and their impulsivity went down. They didn't just start being better state, they started healing. Structured, ritualized environments are crucial. In schools, when we studied the best practice schools in the United States, main rituals were how kids came into school, lunch and dismissal were the most predictive of how healthy the school environment was. Schools that did those three things really well had good, strong environments. Best classrooms usually had at least the beginning class ritual. I will go as far as to tell you that a neurobiological ritual that anchors your social interaction is a low and goodbye. If you start to look at the approach we take in education, it is this. For the individuals who adapt slowest to change, we expose them to hardly nothing. Because when we expose them, it's terrible. And for the kids who learn really well, they get the most exposure. 
The trick with these kids isn't that you don't expose them, is that you expose them through a certain, certain kinds of approach and certain things you might have to expose them to more than one time. It starts to become crucial because if you don't start to expose them, you start to have go completely against the science. So let me see, for the people who don't adapt well, our modus operandi is expose them to nothing. Then how will they adapt at all? There's also a thing considered by most teachers, subconscious is basically age appropriate learning. Teachers stand on top of front of a room and assume a certain level of understanding and exposure based on the fact that you're in my class. How do they do that? If I've been teaching second grade for six years, I know what second graders think like. If I've been teaching ninth grade for 12 years, I know what ninth graders, most ninth graders have been through. So my assumption is you come into here with what? Ninth grade knowledge. So the first thing you need to start to understand is the biggest issue with poverty, which is the number one thing we talk about when we talk about exposure is this. Poverty limits the things you are exposed to. If you limit the things you're exposed to, you're going to be slower to adapt. Now, there are people who do run around and try to tell you parody, par poverty is a paradigm. Poverty is not a paradigm. The people who are slow to adapt, if they have been limited to their exposure, the number of things they will adapt to is limited. But let me talk about something that you might not be aware of. Um, Microsoft arcades. What are Microsoft arcades? Microsoft arcades are a constant movement of your eyes. So let's say I'm in conversation with you. My mind, my eyes will do this. To focus on you, it will eventually lower the accuracy of the vision around you and lower the sound of the vision around you so I can focus on you. But since that's going to happen, to keep me alive, Microsoft arcades are basically a constant scanning of the entire environment. This way, if something happens in your peripheral, you can still see it. So my, constant, my micro arcades are scanning and I am still able to focus. Micro arcades are also trained to pick up things that can harm you, but they also pick up things that you are attracted to and things that are highly familiar. The kids who are the most damaged will focus on everything that they don't need first. Now you can start to apply that in your also everyday life and go back to some phrases you've heard before like pathology attracts pathology. A a pathology attracts pathology because my eye will notice that which I'm familiar with first. This also starts to tell you why oftentimes you marry mom and dad because the person you spot is familiar and you justify it as attraction. High emotional experiences, what you'll do when under stress. Your amygdala is in charge of your survival. It is the first processor of your world. It is also in charge of reading all your nonverbal cues. Everyone's amygdala has three values. The need to be safe. That's why ritualized environments are so crucial. The need to be loved or feel wanted. And the need to be successful. These three things motivate every person in this room. In your emotional brain are the best things and the worst things you've experienced. In your emotional brain are your values and your attractions. So make sure you understand this. Anything you think you value is not because I'm a logical, rational person and I've come up to this reason that these are the reasons I value this. Your values were first start off as an emotion that you learned to justify through lots of rational thinking. Anything that's different alerts your amygdala. That's why ritualized patterns help because it's eased by commonality. On the other side of the equation was your big old cortex, this outer layer of stuff that makes us logical, planning creatures. Your cortex has gone through a massive growth. Since our cortex is so big, we have started to perceive that man is the most rational creature in the face of the earth. But the amygdala, although it's small, it has clout. Because when the amygdala gets overly stressed, it releases a hormone that cuts off all interference from the cortex. So make sure you understand what I'm saying. It doesn't matter what you know. It only matters what you know in your emotional brain. As a result, we know something here that's crucial. Anything you'd give me 
to help me deal with my emotional behavior better be my emotional brain or you've done nothing for me. We go to a lot of schools and we, we've studied best practice programs. And here are some of the distinctions between most schools that fail and best practice program. The schools that are failing, when we go and visit them, we say, what are you working on? And they say, world peace. <laughs> no, seriously, world peace. They go like, what are you working on? We're changing issues of disproportionality, world peace. We're taking kids who are six grades behind and getting them to the proper grade level in two years, world peace. Then we go to schools that have actually achieved change. And here's what we found out they did. They identified concrete actions. By the way, there is no change without concrete action. And they identified the actions they wanted people to do and when they wanted to do it specifically. Step two, promote social comfort. Promote social comfort. Your amygdala is alerted to differences and eased by commonality. If we really want to do this, there's two things we have to do. Restore the belief that you can be successful and you can store a belief through concrete actions and then help them experience sequences of success to, so they can be motivated. So the first thing we did was, okay, we started classes with 60 second focus activities. Teacher gets up, goes like this. That means prepare for the activity. Then they do this. Here's the directions. Then they do this. This is the time allotted for the drill. So you're telling me kids who are constantly committing the same infractions that giving them nothing but heartache and, and cause them nothing but trouble are addicted to the behavior? Yeah. Let's say the kids actually connects to you. The kids learn to trust you. You've got a decent relationship. So the kid tries the behavior. Now he's replaced the behavior that used to give him dopamine. And now he's not getting any dopamine because he's doing what you want him to do. What's depression to the brain? Depression to the brain is anything that causes a dramatic shift in the brain's chemical disposition. So guess what usually happens to these kids? They get depressed. I'm doing what you want. Everybody else is happy though. You're doing so well, you're doing so well. Meanwhile, this field kid feels like crap. And remember, depression doesn't mean they're gonna be moping around. Some people's depression comes up in aggression. So it can be both extremes. They get depressed because they're now doing what everyone said they should do, and they feel worse and worse and worse, and it builds and it builds and it builds, and they finally do the wrong thing again. And then they try again, and they fail again. And they try again, and they fail again. And then they reach a conclusion which anyone who's had any sense should meet, right? They should say what? Maybe I can't do it. Maybe this is who I am. And that moment they reach that conclusion, they quit. I pray that some of the things that we have talked about today would go past your cortex to a place called the reward pathway so that you may change your behavior in order to change the behaviors of others. And let me end with one simple saying. If the healthiest people are incapable of making the change, they should not be asking anyone else to change. Amen? Thank you, guys.